cause of anti-Semitism. That's number one. Number two, is it genetic? First, uh, I will deceive you. I am not a specialist of anti-Semitism. I am really, Yarad is totally focused about the murder. So when you arrive in a village, I give you an example. I interview a guy, he was working in Gestapo. And until now, he doesn't know what I think. I re-interviewed him three times. Because he was here when we received the phone call to take the decision of the death, which day we will kill the Jews. So his declaration is unique. And you must know that in your head, we don't show what we think. So even if the guy, by example, if the guy is serving food to the killers during the shooting, for us, he's the best witness. Because he will have seen everything. So um, for anti-Semitism, I would say there is anti-Semitism in bad countries. But when there is no anti-Semitism, the Germans killed also the Jews. So, but, but I'm not a specialist about anti-Semitism. And I would not qualify a murder only an anti-Semite. In France, we have many anti-Semites. But uh, they don't kill Jews every day. And here, it's another story. Here you have people, uh, by example, I know a woman. She was uh, old. And her daughter married a Jew. And she was against this wedding. It was a war. So he went to army. The Jew went to Red Army, like every Soviet person. And she, the grandmother, she took the opportunity that her daughter was to the market. She brought the six little children to the Gestapo to make them shot. And they have been shot. So it's to show you there is a, during this genocide, there is a jump. It was anti-Semite, surely. But it's when you make your three little children killed by the, the Nazi, I call the, I, I, we call it a criminal. I don't call it an anti-Semite. We study really the crime. We are really specialists, I would say, in the study of the crime. I could make a topic about anti-Semitism, but it would take for me another conference and minimum one hour uh, to describe what I know and to distinguish the actual anti-Semite from Islamist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But really, it's an, uh, for me, it's, uh, I cannot classify all that in anti-Semitism. Anti and unfortunately, by example, this guy, seven years old, you can say it's anti-Semite, but it's first a child. And why seven children go to see the shooting of 1,000 others? Yes? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I am born in Romania, and where you're going next year or soon. Uh, my family came from Bessarabia and Ukraine. I visited Odessa and Babi Yar last year. And thank you very much for this very moving and very erudite, I would say, uh, rendition of, of this horrible thing which we know. But if you put in historical perspective, Jews have been killed historically all along in Romania, in Ukraine, in Poland by pogroms. And you know that has been an, the undertow of this is why many Jews have left these countries. You know the story of Odessa and you know Professor King in this university has written a riveting book which shows that one country, not the Germans, Romania, single-handedly finished the Jews of Odessa. Mm. So that tells you something, that that's not an incidental event. It was a very organized, diabolically organized event. But that has put, you know, it's like something, a festering wound which comes up, you know, the pus comes up. This is how, what happened with, with the German problem. So, you know, you have here a very important anthropologic situation where when you think of somebody who is subhuman, subhuman, and less than you, you can do anything to that person and not feel guilt. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the way these people were feeling because throughout from infancy, they are taught that the Jews, even if you don't know the Jews, you are taught that the Jews are no good and the Jews have to be killed. And so then you know that 
what is done to them is correct, and you feel no guilt. It's not only that you don't part you're not part of the group which is killed. You think that they deserve eventually what they're getting. And that, unfortunately, is pervasive to this day. And you see a resurrection of these feelings in many of these countries post-communist. So, you know, the communist regime, what they did, and I'm sure you encountered, they never mentioned Jews on all these monuments, they have had a monument in Babi Yar, if not for Yevtushenko who brought up the issue and they were ashamed of the fact they, they wouldn't have even done that. So, you know, it's, it's a very important point and you're doing a fantastic job for educating people and I thank you very much again for the work you're doing. Thank you. I didn't speak about Romania because we only began now and uh, we work for the two genocide in Romania, for the gypsies and for the Jews. And we work in, uh, in Ukraine where the, the village of shootings were. We found many mass graves also of Jews killed by the Romanian. You want to continue? Or? Yeah, Father De uh, Debois, I have a question. Um, you mentioned that the Germans uh, rape the girls. I've never heard that. Okay. Picking up what she just said. Since the Jews were subhumans, they were rats, why would these soldiers, okay, sexual needs, why would they contaminate themselves by raping these women? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a question that I had when I discovered that because people told me it was impossible because the SS were forbidden, etc. Uh, yes, but we found also a text a recent text from Himmler, who said that he had to, put, to open a moratorium in the Soviet Union to legalize the rape of the girls of the undermensch groups because the war was too, too tough. So I think, in fact, Himmler realized he couldn't avoid it. So he put that in the law. So it was legal. What was illegal, it was to to, to, if one body wanted to steal something, that stayed illegal until the end. And you have a, an incredible discourse of Himmler in '43. say we are so proud that never SS took a piece of gold. And we have testimonies and testimonies of SS. There is a, even a, we interview somebody, imagine the case. The SS did the shooting. It was very cold, it was winter. We interview a guy, the family was living near the train station. So the SS came by foot from the mass grave and they entered in his farm because it was warm to change their shoes. And one, he take a handkerchief full of gold teeth that he had taken to the Jews and he proposed to the farmers to exchange them for against money. The same, two hours after the shooting. So that's also a question is that also we see in the, in the we cannot distinguish so well the racist motivation that sometimes also the motivation to steal everything. Because they were far from Berlin. Who could check where was going all the money, all the goods? And for example, we have the testimony a chief of units is sending by the regular post big carpets that he found in the Jewish homes. And we have a letter from his wife from Germany said, my dear, the carpets were much too large. <laughs> so we must also not under-evaluate the, the fact that sometimes one of the motive also of the killings were to take everything from them. I, I have the testimony of one lady, she's German, she's civilian, and she works as secretary in the Gestapo, but she's not from that. And one morning, her house is just near the ghetto, private house. And one morning, one chief of the killers, he said, tomorrow morning, we, we, we kill all the Jews, if you want to watch. She said, no, I don't want to wake up early. So she went out of her, of her apartment at nine, and the, and the arrestation was at six. You know what she was looking for? She ran to the ghetto alone, as lady, the ghetto empty because she has ordered a big fur coat to a lady, a Jewish lady, 
And she said, I'm not sure I will find it back. And she was also given 10 watches for reparation inside the ghetto. She said, finally, I found back the, the watches, and I couldn't ba find back my fur coat. So I made an official protestation, and they found it the day after. So, and she said like that, she said, oh, I saw when they brought the, the Jewish girl, the last Jewish girl in a, in a truck, one, she had wonderful shoes. So I say that because uh, when you read this kind of testimony, she sees only what she, got, what she can find back after the shooting, as shoes, as watch. It's like if she was in a shop in the empty ghetto. So that's also one of the, of the reasons. They were raping the girls, that's sure, now. I, it's the first person who told me that it was in the ghetto of Brest, Brest-Litovsk, in, uh, in, uh, today with Belarus. It was a force worker. His job was to pack the belongings of the Jews as prisoner and to sell them by auction for the German. And I asked him, did you work day and night or only day? And I don't know why I asked that, because it's a strange question. He told me, no, no, we couldn't work in the night, because in the night the German entered in the ghetto 10 by 10 to rape the Jewish girls. And I, I remember I stopped the interview. I said, no, it's a mistake. I said to the translator, you made a mistake. It's impossible. And uh, we made a long interview, and he explained it was organized even. So uh, now we have a bunch of testimonies about that. Uh, in, where my grandfather was prisoner near the camp was a ghetto. And the chief of the ghetto came during six months, the German chief of the ghetto, came six months at the, do at the door of the ghetto at the gate, to ask for one Jewish girl. He called, he called them a cat. They had to give one girl, he was raping the girl and killing her the same day. He came six months every day. Every, all the city knew it. So I say that because you are really confronted when you study Holocaust in post-Soviet Union, no camp, no tattoo, no train, no gas camber, no selection, crime, 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 crime. They open the box, but the, the question that I have is that they know exactly who they have to kill. The Jews, the gypsies, but the way the rest, they are free, like criminals. So it means when you as a coordinator genocide, you open the box of Pandora. It means you, you, you send them to, to, to the exact category of victims, but the rest, it will work by itself. So I think in a genocide, there is this kind of archaism in the humankind that appears because, by example, when they play with the children, they, they send the children in there and they shoot. They do that everywhere. Nobody tells them to do that. So it's what I call a kind of archives that we have in front of us, and suddenly it appears. I saw a phrase say that for, in, in, in one of the books, for Himmler, the problem was not to ordinate, Holocaust was to coordinate. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'll begin by adding my voice to everybody here and so many of you here, thanking you so much for your work. Um, my question, I, I gather from your presentation, and I had understood it, I think before that in the Ukraine, pretty much all the Jews were um, exterminated. Uh, it is a surprise to me that the same was true in Belarus. And so I guess my question is, am I correct? to surmise from your presentation that that was also true in Belarus. Ah, yeah, of course. Yeah. It was true. The difference is that uh, the Belarusian never accepted really the occupation of the German, so they were fighting a lot, and there were always in Belarus pockets of resistance. For example, there are some forests where the German could not enter. It stayed Soviet territory. So when a, a Jew survived from a shooting, he ran there and he, he entered to the partisan. So we have many Jews who became partisan. Men and women. Men and women. But was Belarus beyond the area where Jews from Poland and Germany had come into Russia, or No, uh, they they, the, the German, they entered in all this. For them, it was Soviet Union. No Belarus, no Ukraine, not that. They, they, were, they had this... Uh, uh, accord with Stalin, suddenly they break the accord, they enter in the Soviet Union the same day. 
They enter the same day in Ukraine, in Belarus, etc. And they have to cross that to enter in Russia. The, the truth also is that Stalin was very surprised, never thinking that Hitler would attack. So at the beginning, there is no resistance for nobody because it's a surprise. Thank you. Rape has always been a crime of violence more than a sexual crime. And it's been used for a genocide, many genocide uh, situations. So um, uh, uh, thank you for investigating that more too. I, I, I suspect that'll be, a, uh, there'll be discoveries that rape is used as that kind of violence. Um, the other thing, um, uh, I wanted to, so when we talked about the cause of uh, anti-Semitism and where it comes from, um, I think, uh, Professor Berliner Rao would know more about that than I would, but um, I'm wondering if, um, you said it's an anthropological qu question. I wonder if there's something that used to be called the heart of darkness in all human beings um, that could be brought out under the right circumstances. Um, fear of the other, fear of someone who's different, um, uh, material uh, theft, things like that. I just, I just think it's a, it's a, I'm glad you're asking that anthropological question. For, for me, it raises anthropological question because I, I made conferences in countries where, for example, I made conferences in Hong Kong. And people told me, oh, don't speak to the Chinese, they are not interested in the low cost, so speak only to the expatriate. And it's enough to say, my, if somebody tells me that, I do exactly the contrary. <laughs> so I spoke only to the Chinese. So, and, and I said to Chinese, you remember Nankin? the massacres of the Chinese by the Japanese, and how they raped the girl, and so on, and so on, and they threw also the, 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 the children in there. I said, Holocaust by bullets was Nankin every day. And I could, so we see that the new, genera that new generation all over the world want to study Holocaust to understand what happened in their country. Because they say Holocaust is like the mother house of all the genocide, and this part of the genocide has always been copied. Nobody did a new Auschwitz. Nobody did a new Sobibor. Nobody did a new Belazek. But shootings are killing people in the field. Now it's a model. You know, uh, what made me think of that, it's why an old Polish man, long time ago, I was in Krakow, and he told me he was not anti-Jew. He was one of the militants. And he said, Hitler made only one mistake, is that he built Auschwitz. So all the Jews come back. There is no Auschwitz, they don't come back. So I say that because why also we work is to say we come back, even when there is nothing symbolic, even if there is no fence, no train, no railway, we come back. And it's a signal also that we make, I would say, as prevention to the genocide, to say, don't worry, soon or late, even if it's six years after, somebody will come back. Because inconsciently, all these mass killers they think nobody will come back because there is nothing. I show you an example. In this village, they threw the Jews in a well, 1,700 Jews. And today there is an erosion, and a part of the well is broken, and all the corpses are inside because the Soviet could never take them. You see inside, the corpses are on the small level of earth. So it's to show you they used anything to kill the Jews. In this case, the well was good. What? In this only well, under, there's 1,700 Jews. And to finish also, that's the investigation about the Roma, the gypsy. This woman, that, what you see, she has been deported with all the family in Transnistria, like uh, you said, from Romania, with the Romanian. And they put them in village, they closed the village, and they were forbidden to go in the next village. So they died by starving. She lost. 75% of the family. Now, we, we brought her back uh, to the mass grave. We paid a ticket. That's her sister, Julieta. The family was thinking she would die. So they gave her to a Romanian family. They said she will surely will die this night, so put a candle. And the grandfather arrived this evening and said, where is Julieta? And the mother said, I couldn't carry her anymore. And uh, so he went back in the village, he called her everywhere, and suddenly she, he found her in a farm. She was still alive. So I say that also because we work also about this genocide. I can tell you it's not easier. 
Because people tell me, oh yes, but they steal everything. I say, uh, but does it mean when it's a people that people don't like it, it's okay to genocide them? So I say that because uh, the genocide of the Jews in post-Soviet Union was really not known enough. The genocide of the gypsies is totally unknown and don't interest anybody. So they are like a drop in, in history. So I say that because we, we have now the challenge and I think the connection with American universities, with American centers is really challenging for us because it's the main place when we see that people who study genocide also think how to prevent new ones. If they don't study it, to study it. They study it because they see that mass crimes go on, that anti-Semitism go on, that hate against Jews or against other population goes on. So we have a lot of new people, new generations say we need Holocaust studies to be able, if one day we are doctor, if one day we are social worker, in one day we are in army in a country where there is genocide to know what to do. And always I say to the new generation, the changement is that today with a small camera you can take a picture. So if one day when you will be older, you are sent in these countries, please take a picture and send to CNN. Because a picture is much stronger than any dis political decision. Because all the genocide are quick. And for the politician, it takes time to decide how and when and uh, if it's possible or not to, to act against the genocide. And most of the time, the genocide is, is already finished. So we are also in this dynamic in Yarad to network with other organizations who work about other genocide, like Rwanda, like Darfur, to see how to act, how to build a network of people. And I think you are here different teachers in high school. I would say in your schools, you have the next generation who will be the wall against the genocide. If they know what is a genocide in a, in a farm. Because many times we, we study a genocide from the decision you can see a genocide from a satellite, and you see the units who go like that. You can see from a plane, and you see also. And you can see that from a farm in a village. It's another story. We try, Yarat, to bring our part to show what is a genocide in daily life in a village, because tomorrow, perhaps, one of your students will be in one of these villages. Um. This is extremely moving. My, my name is Mindy Reiser. I lived in Kazakhstan, and I, I worked in Georgia. So I have met people who came from yeah. Moscow and from Ukraine that went out. Um, refugees. Refugees, yes. In fact, one of them even heard the voice of Stalin on the telephone. She, she will never forget that. She was a translator. But I wanted to ask you about redemption and trauma. Now, you've talked to people who have seen unspeakable horrors. Do you have a sense, they said they hadn't talked about it before, but some of them, especially after Soviet Union fell, um, they could go to the Russian Orthodox churches, some of them could go to the Catholic churches. Do you think they talked to the priests? Do you think they talked to each other because that, that horror must have buried so deep? And how did it manifest itself? Um, again, you have many, many tasks to do, but one thing to look at is how it affected village life, how it affected the communities in terms of trust in each other. We, we have different cases. First, it's like the question of part anti-Semitism. As we are so much focalized about the crime, we don't, we have, so you know, we are only 20% to find back 2 million corpses. So it's an incredible story. And, uh, it's because I say that because it needs money, it needs to find support, political support, etc. So a big part of energy is taken by that. I can tell you that the guilt for me is an incredible question about that, the feeling of guilt. I interview, I give you different examples. I interview in the very beginning a carpenter who built the gas camber of Belzec. He was a worker, he was not uh, the boss. But nevertheless, he built it and he explained how he built the door with two pieces of food and we put sand in the middle so people from outside will not hear the noise from inside, etc., etc. And uh, it was the very beginning. I had no team. Yara didn't exist and so on. And um, for me, it was strange to meet a guy who built a gas camber. And at the end of the interview, I, he knew I was priest. He ran, I went out of his farm, and he ran after me and he said, Father, Father, I will be punished for what I did. 
And I was already not bad in interview, I would say. So I say, punish for what? He told me, because we worked on Sunday. And uh, so I said, uh, uh, so you are in another world, you know, you must understand. So I say, but you got the authorization to work on Sunday? He said, yes, we went to see the priest to have the authorization, but you know, Father, it was the only day they gave the salary, so we had to work on Sunday. And uh, so I didn't answer. And, but you know, when you build a gas chamber and that your guilt is to have been working on Sunday, so... Um, and um, I, I, another one, it was, also, he was a priest himself. It was my first witness. Uh, he was also from Belzec. And he, he climbed on the, on the roof of the church to see people entering in the gas chamber with binocular. But all the village did that. It was not special to the priest. They climbed on mountain so that the German had to put trees to avoid the village to watch everything. And same thing, it was my first witness. It was not an interview. We had no camera. It was uh, on a table in the parish with a young priest, a sister of the priest, etc. And I asked him, it was not difficult for you to see all these dead people every day? And his answer said, it was difficult for me because my mother couldn't bear the smoke. So she was headache, and she was, I had to lose all my afternoon to take care of my mother. It was the beginning of my investigation, but I can give you many examples like that. So after 2,800 interview about guilt, what I know is that when it was legal, you much feel less, you, you feel less guilt. They, f they feel guilty when they stole something because it was illegal. But to kill Jews, to kill gypsies was legal. So there is a connection, unfortunately, because between the guilt and the legality of the act. It's much easier to make somebody explain the killing than to make somebody explain that they stole something. For example, if nobody wants to say where is the mass grave, sometimes there's total silence in the village. You ask, here they don't know, here they don't know, here they don't know. Everybody knows. We were sure that there are growing potatoes or tomatoes on the mass grave, that's the only problem. But the rest, they can explain you, all the shooting, all the death, all the rape. But to say somebody is growing tomatoes, I don't know. Because there is a problem having stolen something. Because stealing, stealing was illegal. Uh, I'm over here. Uh, Mike Kurtzig, uh, who's been teaching the Shoah for 10 years now in Philadelphia, in Beijing, and now in Alexandria. And I'm only here because my father remembered the words of Heinrich Heine, which were written in 1820, when they burned books, soon they will burn people. And he left two months after, after Hitler came to power, right after the book burning. And what I wanted to ask you, first of all, thank you very much for the explanation, because when I teach it, and most of us who teach it, teach about Auschwitz and Maidanek, about Treblinka and about perhaps the life that was before and, uh, and the ghettos and uh, the long way home. We don't teach so much about the Einsatzgruppen. And so what you explained over here is sort of a new dimension, which I will teach now, so quite, quite a bit different. But I wanted to ask you uh, about the people themselves. Yad Vashem has put together a list now. I think it's almost four million. When I was there, it was about three million. Now it's four million. Do we have the names of these people? Because you mentioned the Nazis listed them, and the Nazis were very meticulous about the whole Shoah. That is uh, basically noting everything that happened, including the number of uh, lice in people's head, uh, which was recently discovered when the, the Russians released some of the, of the, uh, of the Nazi uh, documentation. So are these names being, uh, first of all, are they available? And second of all, are they being listed? It's complicated in Soviet Union. Uh, Soviet Union has its own culture, and um, most of the people in Soviet Union had, had a nickname. So first we have a patronym. So we say you are Alexandra, and what is your patronym? Petronivna. It means she's the son of Petrov. So if the family knows the patronym, it's okay. And if the family knows the nickname, because they say, oh, we, everybody called her uh, Pana Nina, Nina. And that's it. Because it was a tradition in Soviet Union to give a nickname. So we have a list. So, sometime, yes. Sometime, by example, a girl, she, she was a girl, and she counts the name of the, 
of everybody in the class who has been killed. So all these names are copied and transmitted to Yad Vashem. So for that, it's OK. But you must understand, in some cases, like in Bogdanivka, it's 45,000 Jews who have been shot. So you have no name. For the Soviet, they, they use the, the German, they use the name when they is far east. But in, in, the, in Ukraine, for example, they don't use the name. They, they, they work with the local people to know where they are. They know the number of Jews. Don't forget that in the units where local people who knew everybody, they built a police work for them. In every country, it's not special to Ukraine. So these policemen were not policemen, in fact, were policemen since two weeks, one month, three months. They were from the village. So they knew exactly everybody. Yes. Hi, Father, I was just wondering, very simple question, although obviously with um, unimaginable uh, ramifications, whether your research now um, alters the number, the classic number for the number of Jews who were exterminated during World War II. Did you find? So that it would be a question we can, can be solved only at, only at the end. For, for answering scientifically to this question, it would take two, three years to open all the archives of immigration, of evacuation, because Soviet archives of evacuation existed because you couldn't travel in the Soviet Union like that. So you, they were registered. So there are registers of Jews arriving. And we could, me, I think, but it's only an idea, it will be near, at least for East, one million more than what we said. But I cannot say for the global number. We, for that, because the deniers are only waiting for that. And always I say also, you know, me, I work when I was young, I work with Mother Teresa. And many people ask to Mother Teresa, how you can stand in Calcutta, you are one and there are 500,000 people. And she said, I never saw 1,000, I only saw one. And also, it's one thing that helps me and all people of my team of Yarat to stand. We are not working to find one million. We're working to find the family vice papier. It's Rick, Anna, the rabbi, the uncle, the grandfather. And sometimes we, we give as much energy for a mass grave for one family, but for a mass grave of 10,000 people. But surely, what helps us to stand is to save the, to reintegrate in humanity these families that we find back. But, but to, to, to answer your question would be, we have, we're thinking of that, but it would be a workshop of three, four, five years. Two questions. One, um, are you also? He said only one. Oh. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go with the first one. Are are your books and the research translated into Ukrainian and Polish and all these languages? And uh, how are they received uh, back there? And are, have you seen an effect, sort of, um, of people not wanting to talk anymore, perhaps because they know it's going on the record? So the book has been translated in different languages, and among them in Ukrainian. It has been sponsored by uh, the French Institute of the Embassy in, uh, in Kiev. And uh, it has been uh, shown to the public and given to the public. Uh, where there was an exhibit that has been built in different countries. It has been shown in America only in New York, in Jewish heritage. But it has been shown in the main capital of Europe. And this exhibit has been shown in Kiev with a great, great publicity. Even the chief of state came to the inauguration, etc. And uh, what was uh, strange for me is that they trained 20 guides to guide the exhibit. And all the guides were less than 25. So me, I stayed three days after the opening to see who was coming to see. And same thing, the people who were coming to the exhibit were less than 25. So for me, there is hope. There is hope that a new generation will say, OK, it happened. It was not me, it was my grandfather, my grandmother. And if we assume it, we can go forward. If we don't assume it, we stay back. So I'm full of hope for that. And uh, also, we, we built Yarad with Shoah Foundation of Spielberg. We published 
something in Ukrainian, a booklet and a DVD with a testimony, and it has been given to 1,000 teachers of high school. And uh, Robin brought, we, we, we built a, small, a toolkit that we'll give to all the teachers in English that you can use with the students. So I would say in Ukraine, you have more than 1,000 schools where they teach that now. But uh, you were right, I was afraid of a boomerang. And I would say, no, there is a part of the country who wants to know. But you know, it was such a Soviet tradition since long time, it was a taboo Holocaust. So it was forbidden to say we kill Jews. But uh, I am optimist for that, I'm optimist. With the new generation, we are optimist. Father Dubois, I want to say two thank yous. One, thank you for the incredible presentation you've given us today. And the more obvious thank you, thank you uh, for the work you've done. Thank you so Merci much. Thank mm -hmm. you.